All right, so welcome to week 10. Today we're talking database security. Um, it's an interesting topic in the sense that every database server does it differently. So we'll be talking in very generic terms with some very specific MySQL examples thrown into it. Um, there's some things that are, gener are the same across the board, but for the most part, the implementation is quite different from server to server, as in not just how you do things, but what you can do. Um, so we're going to talk about database security and some of the guidelines, how to make things secure. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, users and privileges and uh, what kind of privileges that you can give and some examples. And in this case, the examples are going to be MySQL specific. All right. So database security ensures that only authorized users can perform authorized activities at authorized times. Do you notice the most repeated word in that sense? The word authorized. So basically put the whole point of database security is making sure that people are only allowed to do what they're allowed to do when they're allowed to do it to the things they're allowed to do it to. Uh, anybody who's ever dealt with any kind of security has experienced this. Um, if you work in a work at a job where you have to tap to get through certain doors and some people can, some people can't, and some people can only go through those doors at certain times, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you've experienced authorization issues. Um, so when you're developing database security, you tend to determine the user's processing rights and responsibilities. And then often you'll enforce the requirements both using the database and the application program. And um, I'll explain in a few minutes also why a lot of this stuff is becoming less and less common. Um, but That'll, that's a topic for a bit later. All right, so pretty much all database products provide security features. Um, they allow you to limit which actions you can perform. So it can limit if you can insert, update, or delete. It can limit which tables you can work on. Um, you can create groups and create users. So you can give certain privileges to a user and give other privileges to groups. Um, Almost all database products have some form of username and password. Some do it better than others. Um, I can guarantee MySQL does not do it well. It does it. And it's actually got a really cool feature on how it does it. But there's a reason why MySQL and MariaDB by extension are the only ones that do it. All right. So the database security model works as follows. You'll have users, either specific users or specific roles, and a user can belong to multiple roles. So obviously, each role can have multiple users um, that have a set number of permissions applied to it, and these permissions are tied to specific objects. So the way they've got uh, the example set up here is Eleanor can execute the month-end store procedure. Uh, James can alter all tables. Uh, Richard can't do anything. On the other hand, you've got groups like accounting, tellers, shop managers, and accounting can update the customer table and potentially none of the other roles can do anything. Uh, they could maybe read, that's it. Um, so when somebody connects to the database server and it tries to interact, what it'll do is it'll read the person's permissions, apply a mask before it allows you to interact. Uh, has anybody in here ever dealt with Windows domain permissions? Ever experienced dealing with Windows domain permissions? So Windows is a range of something called ACL access control lists. Essentially, the, role, the rules work in such a way that your permissions are built up. You have a minimum number of permissions, and every time you're added to a group, it adds more permissions to what you can do. Databases are similar. By default, users have no permissions. And then you can give them permissions as needed or you can add them to groups and the permissions build up one on top of the other. So eventually it'll build a mask of yes, you're allowed to do certain things and no, you're not. Uh, apparently you guys probably recently did your uh, permission stuff on Linux. It's not quite the same, but not that different either where you, know, you got certain read write execute privileges. 
on certain objects and depending what group you're on, you know, you've got the the four, the three octets of permissions. Uh, it's a similar concept in this, except you don't have to remember, uh, you know, 744 or 655 or any of that kind of crap. Okay, so security guidelines for your database server. Number one, always put it behind a firewall. I think that goes without saying. Uh, but you should also plan as if the firewall doesn't even exist or the firewall's already been breached. Um, because most database, um, what's where I'm looking for, breaches, so let's go with that, is usually done from the inside of the network, not from the outside. I mean, there's the odd case where somebody's stupid and they let their database be connected to the world and it's not properly secured and you know people get in that way. But most of the time, most breaches happen from the inside. Whether it's social engineering where you know you got some person's password and you know you convinced them to let you connect and then you connected and it could be a bunch of different things. Um, you want to keep your OS up to date and keep your databases up to date as possible. Uh, sometimes keeping your database up to date can be tricky um, because minor version updates are usually safe. Sometimes you got major version updates where things stop working. Um, I can, that one I can testify to. Uh, the database server we're using at work, um, casting, automatic casting between integers and strings in one version, they released version eight and that stopped working and a bunch of our code exploded when we did the upgrade. We didn't realize that was a issue because we read release notes and, you know, we didn't really understand what the magic words they use because they use really technical jargon. And uh, when they released 8.1, magically, the casting came back um, because I guess a lot of people weren't happy about that feature being taken out. Uh, so you want to keep your, your database software as up to date as you can while being careful to not break your stuff. Um, but definitely keep your OS up to date. The next step is you want to use the fewest network protocols possible. So some database servers will allow you to connect multiple ways. Microsoft SQL Server is notorious for this. Um, you can connect using ODBC. You can connect using uh, the .NET libraries. You can connect using uh, two or three other protocols. And the thing is, is yet you want to have as few open ports as possible on your server. That just goes for any kind of service, not just database, right? If you've got a web server and it's not supposed to do anything else, you shouldn't have, you know, every port open, probably just port 80 and port 40, maybe port 22 if you need to SSH. But even that, you don't want to keep open if you don't have to. Yes, exactly. So every open port is a gateway, is a vector for attack. So you want to have as many things as turned off as possible. Um, in the database server itself, you might want to delete unnecessary unused system level stored procedures. Um, that one you have to be really careful um, because you might delete something that the database server actually needs. Uh, so you definitely want to do a lot of research before you start deleting system stored procedures because those are stored procedures when you create the database, the database server puts in automatically for you because it thinks you're going to need them. Or I should say, it thinks it's going to need them. Uh, but like anything else, if you have unneeded code running, there's always a risk that somebody finds an exploit and manages to run it. Um, disable guest login, disable default logins. Um, that is, you know, usually a good idea. And unless absolutely required, never allow all users to log on to the database interactively. And I'm going to add a post fix on that one. It's never required. You will have one or two users that need to be able to connect to the database interactively. In other words, they connect and can run SQL commands. One or two users at most. There should be never anybody else except for very specific users that can connect to, especially production, maybe on the development environment or staging environment, you can have multiple users that need to test and stuff. But once it's production, you should only ever have one or two users. Um, 
You also want to protect the computer that runs the database. Um, you should never allow someone to actually sit at that keyboard. If it's on a computer that can be sat at a keyboard, it should be behind a locked door. That's, you know, goes without saying. It's a server room. Not everybody should be able to get into the server room. Um, and if anybody's accessing that room, honestly, uh, it should be recorded in a log of some sort. It should be like behind a tap or so we know who tapped in. Um, maybe have a security camera. And it sounds like, you know, I'm being a little pedantic about it. However, the number of breaches that have happened because of stupid things where people left a door open, people could use the computer, connect to it, that kind of thing. Yeah, assume the worst. I mean, I can give an example of assuming the worst company I work at years and years and years and years ago. So this would have been 20, oh, 19 years ago, roughly. Uh, we were still at the point where we trusted our employees. And the server room door was often left open because it got really hot in there and it wasn't a proper server room. We were just leasing office space from some company and they didn't want us to put in proper air conditioning in the server room because they didn't want us to do that. And uh, we had a, um, a fella who decided he wanted to know what people were emailing about. So he waited till nobody was paying attention. He walked to the server room and put forwarding rules on certain people's email accounts so that they were forwarding to his email. Um, how did we find it? One day we were restoring from a backup. We noticed that he had copies of all the partner's emails in his mailbox. Like, at least if you're going to do something stupid like that, forward it to an external mailbox, not to the one on the network. But, you know, I guess he thought maybe if it's not leaving the building, nobody will notice, right? Um, yeah, the server room door was definitely locked after that. And I think three of us in the building actually had keys to get into the server room. Um, Again, because they wouldn't let us put tap taps on the doors because they didn't want us drilling holes in the walls. Landlords. So that's a security guideline. So never allow someone to sit at the computer. Like, for example, in Amazon, when you have a database in their cloud services, the computers that run that service, people can't log into them. Like, they literally mount them in a rack they plug in a USB stick, they hit a button. In actual fact, most of the time, there's not even a USB stick. There's a special, um, the, a lot of the high-end motherboards actually have an onboard USB port where you can actually, or an SD card where you can plug in an SD card and the OS is on that. So they plug in the card, they put it in the rack, they turn it on, they walk away. It comes up, announces it to the rest of the system and it just images itself to the latest whatever needs to be there. That is the safest environment. So you want to manage accounts and passwords. Um, you want to use the lowest privileged user possible for whatever services you're running. Um, make sure that they have strong passwords. That one is if you allow connections from anywhere. If you only allow connections from itself or a trusted subnet, the strong password is not that serious um, because with anything else, if somebody has physical access to the computer, the password means nothing. Um, for MySQL, I need to do is take the files, turn off the SQL server, copy the files, put them in mine and turn on the SQL server and magically I got your database. Yay. Uh, Postgres is even easier. You go and you modify a file called uh, PGHBA you just change something from password to trust and it just trusts you to connect it. So database passwords are, you know, useful if it allows networks like broad connection sources. But if it's on a very specific subnet, they're not that important. Um, but, you know, for liability's sake, you should always have strong passwords because there's always that one risk. Um, you should take keep track of failed login attempts. Um, most database servers will drop that into a log file when somebody tries to connect and there's a failed login. You can go check these log files once in a while and see if somebody's constantly trying to connect. Um, somebody should be checking group and role membership permissions just to make sure. Um, you should audit accounts that have null passwords. Uh, as a rule of thumb, 
most database servers do not allow null passwords anymore. So there's that. Um, and you limit the database administrator account privileges. So you only allow specific people to have that level of access. Uh, you should always plan, have a security plan of some sort to prevent and detect security problems. This could be a as simple as once a week, you have an automated script that checks the login logs and see if there's anybody connecting that they shouldn't be connecting, like from addresses and stuff. And you should have procedures for security emergencies and you should practice them. Um, one of our servers years ago, this was a while back, got root kitted. We don't know how they managed to get a root kit installed on there, but one of our servers got a root kit installed. The good news was they didn't pass that server because of how they got lucky that they got lucky in the sense they were able to do it. They were unlucky because it was running on an, on a uh, separate VLAN from everything else. So it couldn't talk to anything else. But we noticed it after about a week that suddenly this machine's CPU usage was slowly going up and they were using this machine as a spam bot. Network traffic went up, CPU usage went up. We were wondering, why is this machine doing this? And we logged into the machine and discovered that it was sending a lot of email. First thing we did is pull the wire out of the back. I took care of that. Um, and then just re-imaged it back to what it was before the breach. And then patched it to figure out what the heck happened. But so when you have a security emergency, you tend to want to have a plan. And most large corporations have a plan, you know, a a um like a game plan. They call it a game plan. So Security breach A happens, this kind of breach happens. Okay, these are the next three steps we're gonna do. You know, lock down the machine, notify stakeholders, identify, preliminary identify the, how bad this is. Notify the public or customers as needed if it's, you know, really bad. As in they got hold of people's credit card information or, you know, people's contact information. If there's a breach of customer information, then you contact the customers that are affected, that kind of thing. And then you fix the problem, you identify what, you know, what can be done better in the future, et cetera. There could be an entire course. They could literally give you guys an entire course dedicated to doing this. So application security. If the database security features are inadequate, sometimes uh, the security code will be written in the application program. Now, Application security is often provided by the web server. Again, another hole in the system because they can hit another machine. Um, you should try to use the database security features first as much as possible because the closer the security is implemented to the data, the less breach chances there are. Um, that last one, on the other hand, uh, they go, they're faster, cheaper, and probably result in higher quality results and trying to do your own. Uh, yes and no, because you guys are in a web application development program. So this one here will hit near and dear to home. When you write a web app, you define a single user that talks to the database. All the connect, everything goes through that one user. That means that one user has to be able to do insert, update, delete, probably want to take away create, alter, and drop, and that kind of stuff, like take away the DDL commands away, but like it still needs to have the DML. It might need to execute privileges, that kind of stuff. So a web app only has a single user. Therefore, you can't easily give permissions on a user by user basis. If it's a small application where it's a handful of users, sure, you can maybe create users in the database system for every user that connects. So it does an initial connect with the web app and then it switches the user that it's using and keeps connecting as that after the fact. Um, but when you've got a system with thousands and tens of thousands or millions of users, that's not a realistic approach of how you're gonna do the security. Um, so at that point, you're gonna to wanna to have the security in the web app itself. Um, so then your odds are gonna be developing your own or somebody uh, the web development framework I use has built in has a built in set of features. I guess you could call it for security. It has both an authorization and an authentication 
module. Authentication double checks to say you are who you are. And the authorization module checks if you're allowed to do what you're trying to do. Um, actually, my application, I only use the authentication module because we had to write our own authorization module because theirs didn't quite do what we wanted. But even that code is actually stupid simple. It's like 10 lines, 10 lines of code. So it works. It's simple. And so far, it's survived the security scans. Um, so making your MySQL database secure. So you use the, privilege, the principle of least privilege. In other words, for every time you create a user, you start with no permissions and you add on only what they need. You're not going to do a grant all. That is, you might as well just be leaving the door wide open. It's like, you know, oh, I'm going to give uh, permission to such and such to come to my house and they don't even need a key. They can just walk in anytime they want and do whatever they want, and use whatever they want in my house. You don't want to do a grant all. You'll create a user that has the bare minimum permissions. Um, and again, even that is kind of stupid. Um, because, for example, how many of you here have used a WordPress site or set up a WordPress site? Did you know your WordPress user, the database user, has to have full system permissions? Because you add a plugin, it needs to create tables. You uninstall the plugin, it has to delete tables. It uses only a single database user for your entire install. So there's only so much you can do with locking down your users, right? Sure. So normally, uh, what you end up having to have is two users registered in some web apps, one that has privileges for creating certain tasks, and another one just for read and write privileges. Um, and you also want to give access only from the posts that they're connecting from. So again, back to WordPress. If you have a database server, whether it's sitting on the same machine as the WordPress server, or it's sitting in a separate server, that user that for WordPress should only have permissions to connect from the WordPress server. So that if the web server gets compromised and they find out what the username and password is for the WordPress user, they can't connect to another machine on the network and bypass the security in WordPress. So at least if you're gonna say you're only allowed to come in this door from this side. So in this room, right, there's four doors. It's like saying people are only allowed to come in that door. All the other doors are locked. And only one person's allowed to come through that door. So that's what you want to do as much as possible. You want to limit where, who, how they can connect and where they're connecting from. Um, never use black, blank passwords. MySQL, when you install MySQL now, won't let you install with a blank password. So that problem's fixed. Um, it, Theoretically, should be complex and contain alphanumeric and special characters. Um, MySQL used to have a function called password. You used password to encrypt your passwords. It's been uh, deprecated. Um, they've got some other thing now built in. Um, there's SHA2, but even that, I think that's been deprecated now. Uh, most passwords are um, SHA256, and they're salted. Um, so for, how many of you know what SHA1, SH2, SHA2, and SHA256 is? Does anybody in here know what those are? Or MD5 even? Yeah, it's a one-way encryption. It's not even an encryption. It's a hash, as he said. So it's a fingerprint. So when you store passwords in a database, and MySQL does the same thing, Postgres does the same thing, Microsoft has, no, not Microsoft, Oracle does the same thing. Microsoft SQL Server is a different beast altogether. What it does is when you create a user, it stores the user's password. What it'll do is it takes the password, it adds something called a salt to it. So there's a known value to the server, and it basically takes that value and adds it to every password. And then it, in, it runs a hash on it. The hash is a one-way function. It converts whatever it is that's being fed to it into letters and numbers, usually hex. So zero to nine, A to F is usually the set of characters it uses. And 
you know, SHA 256 is a long one versus MD5, which is, I think is like 13 characters or 14 characters. Um, so the fact that it's salted means that even if they decrypt it, they won't know what the password is because the salting changes the password. Um, so MySQL uses something else now. I'm pretty sure it's SHA-256. It means it's a really big hash. The bigger the hash, the more unique the hash is going to be. Uh,
different privileges. Um, then there's the option for a with grant option, which means that user is able to grant permissions to someone else. So example at the bottom is grant all on dbmusic to db user identified by whatever password. Um, so that's saying that you're going to give all permissions to all the tables in a database called db music to a user called db user. You have to give permissions on a per object basis when you do this. You can grant it to a single table, grant it to all the tables by using the asterisks. Um, Column-based security is cool because you can go uh, grant select on everything, but then you can turn around with uh, grant uh, update and insert on specific columns so that when some That's it. <laughs> um, the other one, it tell, I know one of the steps tells you to create a new connection with the new user. So you're going to create a user. I say I'm preemptively answering questions that I'm going to have in lab. I've, these ones I know I've had over the years. So it'll say create a user. So you'll use whatever tools right to create the users. It'll tell you to create a new connection. So you'll go add a connection. And in here, you'll just change whatever user to whatever the lab tells you it's supposed to be. Like I think it's like. Algonquin user seven or something stupid like that. You're gonna put that in there. 